Hi everyone, this is Alyssa Corm with Investors Business Daily and welcome to Investing Strategies. We've got a jam-packed episode for you that continues to explore the ripple effects of the coronavirus pandemic from all angles. One of Zoom's board members and early investors joins me to discuss the platform's growth amid the explosion of remote working and whether Zoom can add staying power as employees start returning to work. Elsewhere in the software sector, we're going one-on-one -on -one with the CEO of top performing growth stock 5.9 on the heels of its quarterly earnings report to learn more about how its cloud-based software is transforming the customer contact experience. Plus, Alibaba is China's e-commerce leader, but it's also expanding in the U.S. on the B2B e-commerce front. The company's North America president for Alibaba.com will shed light on how Alibaba plans to take on Amazon and how it's handling the shift in buying demand for certain products due to the pandemic. And the media industry is grappling with the need to adapt more than ever. EY will provide insights about what it will take for companies to transition from crisis mode to the new normal in entertainment. Investing Strategies starts now. Zoom Video is in the spotlight as user growth of its video communication software has exploded amid the pandemic, and so have the stock's price gains this year. Joining me now to discuss the platform's strategic initiatives and what makes it stand out in an increasingly competitive space is Santi Subotovsky. He's general partner at Emergence Capital, Zoom's largest shareholder, as well as a member of Zoom's board. Thanks for joining me today, Santi. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so at IBD, Zoom's been on our radar since its public debut in April of 2019. And especially this year with the share price gains, it's definitely popped back on our radar even more so. But you were an early investor in Zoom back in 2015. So what was it about the company that made you a believer in its early days? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we've, we've known the company and the team for years. So we first came across Zoom back in 2012. So it was very early in the life of Zoom. And we started using it in 2013. I'm originally from Argentina, so my accent is real. And I started using it with my friends and family down there. And even in the early days, the product worked and people loved it and they started sharing. And then I started getting a lot more invites from other people in Argentina. So that's what caught our eye is that it not only allowed us to transact and have a conversation with people, but it allowed us to build relationships. So that's when we reached out to Eric and we started building a relationship with him. I feel that overall, why the product is much better is because Eric did the hard things early on. I mean, he built the entire architecture from the ground up to scale. And what we're seeing today shows how well built the product is, that it not only supports the incredible user growth that we've been seeing, but they also allowed us to think about how to enhance security, safety, privacy, and roll out a lot of different updates without affecting the performance of, of, of the users. Right. That, that's such a good point. And speaking of scaling up, if we fast forward to today, uh, just an explosion, like I said, of user growth on the platform here. And with that, you touched on this a little bit. Users have been concerned about things like security, for example. So from the management perspective, what do you think has been the most challenging aspect for the executive team uh, with dealing uh, with this heightened growth that the platform is experiencing? Yeah, so we've been seeing this trajectory and people using more and more video conferencing now for years. I mean, it's been a trend that we've been tracking. The company has been uh, experiencing that growth. But in the last few weeks, with everything that's going on, a lot more adoption happened. And a company that was built for enterprise with security and IT teams that were making sure that we had the right password set up and the right protocols for usage. That basically went to almost like a consumer use case where people were expecting Zoom to be their IT department and help them set up passwords, mm -hmm. waiting rooms. So the company had to shift its attention to becoming that IT department for a lot of users. And they rolled out new features and even new updates to the platform that put security, safety, and privacy front and center and give users easy control 
to set up and use all those security features. Right, and uh, with the increased user growth, there's also increased competition now from the likes of Google, Facebook, Microsoft, these big tech giants. So what do you think makes Zoom stand out from the pack and how do you balance this attracting of new free users with paid users as well? The, the company has always been enterprise focused. We have some of the largest companies in the world using Zoom. And that's why that enterprise DNA, that enterprise focus on doing what's right for our enterprise customers is gonna continue being the focus of the company. We, we also feel that there's a responsibility and Eric came out and said this, in this, I mean, stressful times, the company has a responsibility to help people out. And I experienced that at home. I've been using Zoom professionally for many years. Now I have my kids on Zoom a big part of the day. My wife's also on Zoom uh, working with her nonprofit. So it's expanded uh, in terms of how many people are using it and the different use cases. And it's an incredible responsibility to make sure that we can support that user growth and keep people connected and sane in these crazy times. Right, and speaking of different use cases, Zoom has the Zoom app marketplace. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how something like that can help create a more sticky experience for users out there? We experienced something similar uh, early on. We were investors in Salesforce and then Salesforce launched their app exchange that enabled companies to build on top of the platform. And now there are multiple billion dollar companies that were built on top of the app exchange. Viva being probably one of the most notable ones, which we were also uh, investors in. What we see is that on Zoom, people can leverage the platform and build better solutions for Zoom's users without Zoom having to be in every specific use case, trying to be everything for everyone. Zoom is focused on building a robust infrastructure that is reliable, secure, safe, and taking into account privacy. And then people can build companies that are targeting different, uh, different segments. So I'll give you a few examples of companies that we are seeing. So we're seeing companies that are enabling real-time translation on Zoom. So that when you and I are talking, if I switch to Spanish, then we could have real-time translation and you can understand what I'm saying without having to go back to the transcript. We're also seeing companies that are building solutions for small businesses who are running their businesses on Zoom. Think of uh, I mean, yoga studios that are now using Zoom. I have my kids attending paint night sessions on Zoom. So now our, there are companies that are building around that telemedicine, education. So I believe that in the next few years, we're gonna see a number of incredibly successful companies building on top of the robot Zoom infrastructure. Right, uh, it's very powerful when you can start connecting even more people in even more ways with uh, the power of technology. And looking ahead, analysts expect Zoom's annual earnings growth to hit 23% this year and accelerate to 37% next year. So from a strategic standpoint, how does Zoom plan to keep up this momentum beyond the pandemic, and especially as more employees eventually return to work and life uh, go, gets a little bit back to normal? I think that life is gonna get back to a new normal. I don't think the normal we're heading to is gonna be the same normal that we have pre-pandemic. And I believe that the entire demand curve for video conferencing has shifted completely because now people have discovered that they can be as productive and in some cases more productive on Zoom. We're hearing from a lot of the companies that we as venture capitalists invest in is that they're revisiting their long-term real estate strategies because now that they were forced to work remote, they believe that that's something that they want to continue having after we get back to the new normal. So I believe that the new normal is going to have video conferencing more front and center. 
people have overcome the fear of turning the camera off. Right now, it's like you and I are chatting, and I didn't even think about, oh, should I turn my camera on? What's my background going to look like? Because we have the virtual background. And I can be in my bedroom having a conversation with you with a beautiful background, completely engaged. And that's going to show us, and it's already showing us, that we can do a lot more without having to be face-to-face in person. Yeah, well, it'll definitely be interesting to see what exactly that new normal looks like and, and when it might happen and how companies like Zoom are impacted and, and again, how we might see even more use cases than we're currently seeing. It's very interesting, but we'll have to leave it there for now. Sandy, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, coming up next, we're going one-on-one -on -one with the CEO of Five9, a top-performing growth stock that's all about cloud-based customer service software. We'll be right back. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to IBD Live. Okay, here we go. the enterprise software industry group is stacked with top performing growth stocks and today we're taking a closer look at one of the standouts in this group five nine ceo rowan trollope joins me now to provide insights about five nine's cloud-based contact center software and how it's transforming the customer service experience thanks for your time today rowan thanks Alyssa. good to be here all right so five nine has just seen quarter after quarter of this near 30% top line growth. Very impressive. What do you attribute to the company's strong track record? And then also in terms of the total addressable market for this software, how much longer do you think the runway is to be able to keep up such a high level of growth that you've been seeing? Well, we've been very consistent with our execution, Alyssa. So sort of what 5.9 is known for. Um, you know, uh, conservative management um, and, and guidance and beating and raising for many, many quarters. Uh, and, and this last quarter was really all about COVID and helping out on the relief efforts. So that's been a big part of what we've been up to. Uh, we've had a lot of customers come to us, both from a healthcare perspective, looking to help, you know, whether it was in New York City or other places, uh, from a healthcare perspective, as well as on the PPP, we, we stood up 30,000 concurrent lines about 48 hours. So we've been really busy the last, uh, the last three months just doing everything that we can to help with the relief efforts and, and candidly helping our existing customers manage through this transition as well. Yeah, so how have you been able to balance uh, this uh, a flood of demand, it sounds like, with uh, companies on the other hand that have been looking to cut costs in any way they can to survive and that may include their customer service related spending. So uh, how do you balance those dynamics and how are they currently playing out for your business? Yeah, there, there is a lot of puts and takes. So we definitely have had uh, payment requests, payment extension terms, and we've been, uh, we've been working with our customers on that. You know, obviously we want to be them for, be there for them when they need us. Uh, and right now they need us to be flexible. So we've been very flexible with our customers. At the same time, we've seen new customers coming onto our platform with the need to send agents home uh, in this crisis. It's very, very easy with a cloud-based platform, which is what 5.9 is all about. And so literally your agents, all they need is a web browser and a, and a headset, just like doing a Zoom call effectively, uh, but not even with a video. And they can be logged in and working just like they're working from the office. And so, you know, there's been uh, puts and takes. Net, net, uh, you know, we've done well. And it's just really been about keeping our heads down and, and, and working to serve uh, our customers every, every day. Yes. So when it comes to customer needs, what do you think stands out as a significant example of how your customers have really been leveraging this platform in an impactful way? What, what is the platform uh, like in terms of its, its uniqueness in relation to what else is out there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, first and foremost, uh, reliability is, is in the name of the company. 5.9 actually stands for 99.999. 
percent uptime. So we just never go down. We, we, we pride ourselves on the reliability. Our Q1, uh, which just finished, uh, was the most reliable, uh, you know, uh, platform stats that we've ever had in the company's history. So we've done a great job uh, making sure that that customer, that's, that platform works for our customers. Second is all about service and partnership. You know, we have a very service oriented culture. Um, and so we do, we bend over backwards to make sure that our customers are successful. It's something that we're known for in the industry. Channel partners have been recently uh, a big thrust coming at us because of that uh, reputation that we have from a reliability and a service perspective. So, you know, I think those are, those are two areas where we really shine as a company. Well, uh, personalization and data-driven insights, those are some of the buzzwords that we are often hearing right now in the business world. So what strategic initiatives are, are in the works at Five9 that further those goals? Well, number one is, is channel. We, we announced uh, in our Q1 earnings call, we announced an AT&T partnership. AT&T has uh, selected Five9 to power a brand new product that they launched called AT&T Cloud Contact Center. And, and this is significant. Uh, AT&T, who are one of the big movers and shakers in the industry, have decided to lead with a cloud-based offer in the contact center. So you're starting to see the dominoes fall with regards to people accepting cloud as the primary choice. Uh, second, we, we expanded our Zoom partnership. Uh, Eric Yuan and, and I have been building that relationship for some time. And uh, it's going very, very well. We announced some really exciting new features tying Zoom together with Five Nine uh, that helps our customers in, in a whole host of ways. And so there's those are two examples of partnerships. But I think you know the the big strategic thrust for us is on expanding our partnerships and our channels and 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 reach to the market. It's a it's a big market. It's a twenty four billion dollar category. And you know we're a we're a relatively small company. We have you know uh, about thirteen hundred employees. So there's only so many doors we can knock on, and we really need that that extended reach that channel partners can bring to us. All right. Well, thank you, Rowan, so much for coming on the show today and helping our audience learn more about the story behind the impressive growth that Five9 is seeing. Oh, thanks very much, Alyssa. And coming up next, we're joined by the North America president of Alibaba.com to get an inside look at the Chinese e-commerce giant's B2B aspirations in the U.S. Stay with us. I'm Arusha Pierce, and welcome to Investing with IBD. Every week, we are going to give listeners insight on how the market is doing. We'll identify stocks or ETFs that are worth considering and adding to your watch list. Not only do we have investing experts, we like to bring on business leaders. The response from listeners has been amazing. It really feels like we're building this community. Join me every week as we take on the market. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Alibaba is a leading Chinese stock with a strong track record of solid earnings and sales growth. And the e-commerce giant has been expanding its reach in the U.S. Joining me now with a look at Alibaba.com's B2B business in the States is John Kaplan. He's Alibaba.com's North America and Europe president. Thanks for joining me today, John. Great to be here. All right. So first, how has this coronavirus pandemic impacted the part of Alibaba's business that you oversee and what have the challenges and perhaps the opportunities been like as an e-commerce company during this time from you know, procurement to even demand for certain products? Yeah, so uh, first of all, it's terrific to be here with you today. Um, given the pandemic, uh, the most important thing uh, at Alibaba.com is the health and well-being of the millions of uh, buyers on our platform around the world and the over 150,000 sellers globally who use the platform to sell. What we've seen is a 10 to 20 times increase on our platform for the procurement of PPE equipment and our medical supplies uh, have been selling 3X greater than prior to the pandemic. You know, as you know, Alibaba.com is unique our platform is designed to help small businesses around the world uh, reach customers around the world, business customers. And our business models lined up in the interests of those small businesses. You know, we're really an ally to global small businesses. And in this time 
of uh, crisis, we're seeing that businesses are turning to our platforms to source and sell to the world. That's right. And what uh, did it really take to uh, get that platform ready to meet the needs of this changing time? Because we know that a, a lot of businesses from a lot of different industries really had to act quickly to meet the demands of this changing environment. What was that like for Alibaba.com? Yeah, um, that's a great question. You know, we are a customer first uh, platform. And, and so what our team has done has rallied to create content and resources and information to help small businesses that maybe haven't been digital yet quickly digitize to help small businesses that need uh, insights and information about supply chain, financing, uh, cash management, uh, logistics, sort of the whole list of challenges that a small business might face to provide that information to them. So we had a series of, uh, of content that used to be called B2B Tuesday, and it's now B2B Today, where we're, we're publishing content globally to help small businesses navigate these turbulent seas. You know, we really see Alibaba.com as a, a bridge to the next, next decade for global small businesses. You know, we are one of the largest B2B marketplaces in the world. And as you know, um, B2B e-commerce is actually six times larger than B2C e-commerce. So the addressable market's bigger than the B2C market. And more and more small businesses are recognizing that they need to be digital in order to thrive in uh, these changing times, these disruptive times. Right, a huge addressable market here. And not only do you have the coronavirus pandemic to deal with uh, that, that uh, small businesses are grappling with, but due to the global nature of this business, how have the prospects of a renewed trade war impacted the thought process behind how you're working with your customers? I mean, this is a topic that's been ongoing for the past several years, so it's nothing really new, but definitely uh, perhaps an added layer of complexity to the equation here. Yeah, so the, you know, I think we think of it very simply as this, global trade that empowers and unlocks the potential of global small businesses is a good thing. And when I meet with a small business owner in Milan, or a small business owner in Minnesota, or a small business owner in Vietnam, they all have really the same core desires and needs. They want to grow their businesses. They want to reach global markets. They want to feed their families. Uh, you know, send their kids to college. You know, the the U.S. economy is you know, over fifty percent of employer firms are small businesses. So everything Alibaba.com is doing to help unlock the potential of small businesses here in the United States to sell to the Middle East, to South America, to Canada, Mexico, and the world really is, um, I think, helping small businesses thrive. And that's what we're all about. Yeah, and from an investor standpoint, uh, here in the US, when you think of e-commerce, your first thought immediately goes to Amazon. So how does Alibaba.com plan to compete with Amazon here in the U.S., especially on that B2B front? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that question. Um, it's an important one. You know, we are not a competitor to the small businesses that uh, sell on our marketplace. We don't sell any products, um, and we're therefore not here to take any business away from you. Um, and our business model is pretty unique. If you sell $100 million worth of product on Alibaba.com or $1,000, we charge you the same thing. It is an annual subscription fee. We, are, we don't charge a commission or take rate, and we don't use the data in our platform to compete with you. Um, so you know, we are a global platform designed to help small businesses thrive you know, we aren't a retailer masquerading as a marketplace. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I was going to ask you more details about 
the business model here and the structure and how that could be a compelling uh, value proposition to small business sellers when you're comparing that to what Amazon is offering, uh, which in some cases is, is a cut of every uh, sale. So how do you plan to grow the marketplace and, and approach this value proposition with potential new small businesses on the platform? Yeah, so that's, that, um, that's a great question. So what we saw last July, we opened up the platform in North America to make it possible for U.S. businesses to sell to the world on, on our platform. And we had events, I think we had 75 or 80 events. I don't, I'm not sure exactly the number. And we went to cities and towns around America to teach people how Alibaba.com works and to learn from them. And we brought those real life, uh, we call them buildups online. And now we're hosting forums and community events um, on our LinkedIn page, on our Facebook page. You know, we're, we're really do, trying to educate the world and particularly folks here in the United States, how Alibaba.com can help you sell. You know, a distinction that I think is uh, meaningful, the average order on Alibaba.com is around $4,000. You know, the average order on most B2C websites is $30. And as any small business owner will tell you, you, if you have inventory in your warehouse, that sucks all the cash out of your business. And so by selling wholesale, by selling B2B globally, you can move the goods you have and, and t take that inventory and turn it into cash. And businesses need cash flow to pay their employees and invest in growth. And so we think there's a real shift underway where the, what had been traditional business, a fax machine, you know, a uh, salesperson going and knocking on doors is really migrating to digital and to do B2B trade, the only place to really get that done is at Alibaba.com. Yeah, well, e-commerce is a big focus right now, more than ever. And we know that Alibaba is definitely a powerhouse in China. So we'll definitely keep track of the progress that it's making here in the U.S. So thank you so much for your time today, John. Thank you for having me. And coming up next, EY joins us for an update on the media industry and what they're doing during this time to adapt and survive. That's next. MarketSmith will give you a huge edge in the stock market. Better stocks, bigger profits. MarketSmith is the top research platform for IBD. It's just the best tool for individual stock selection. Everything within MarketSmith is designed to bring those best stocks to the surface. It does a lot of the work for you of filtering down to the potential leaders. It's when you take the training wheels off and you're ready to invest on a more professional level. MarketSmith will help you take control of your investment life. If you want to get serious about investing, start your membership today. Even before coronavirus hit the U.S., the increasingly rapid evolution of the media landscape forced executives in that space to face a simple truth, adapt or cease to exist. And the COVID-19 pandemic has seemingly accelerated the need to address that line of thought. Here now to discuss this and more is John Harrison. He is EY's global media and entertainment leader. Thanks so much for joining me today, John. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to see you. Yes. So, with the coronavirus pandemic, how has the focus shifted for media companies from before the pandemic to now? Because it seems like in all sorts of industries, there's been a little bit of scrambling to deal with how to cope with this. Yeah, without a doubt. It's, it's certainly an unprecedented time. And I'd say for the media and entertainment industry, uh, executives are looking at it almost in a two-pronged approach. The first is obviously dealing with the immediacy of the crisis and working uh, around their workforce, their people strategy, and also dealing with maintaining cash flow and liquidity and frankly, keeping the lights on during this first initial phase when we're all sheltering at home. Uh, the other thing that executives are focused on, though, is really trying to understand, based on some early signals, whether this 
COVID-19 environment is going to permanently change how all of us as consumers uh, interact with and purchase and subscribe to media. And we've got some research that is just coming out right now. We surveyed 3,500 U.S. households over the last several weeks, really trying to understand the changes that consumers are making as they relate to media or communications. And some of the early findings are interesting. 27% of all respondents and 43% of those aged 18 to 34, so someone of the younger millennial demographic, do in fact say that at least right now they believe the impact of the coronavirus and the shelter at home and all the changes we're feeling will permanently change how they consume content and, and media more broadly. So some pretty big percentages, at least early on. Yeah, that seems like a, a pretty big uh, thing to need to unlock there for these media companies because with the different consumption habits, that is sure to impact the financial picture. So how are companies grappling with that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Companies are focused on trying to understand, you know, will, will consumers be more inclined to cut the cord and move to an all streaming uh, video relationship? Will consumers ever feel comfortable going back to uh, venues where they aggregated with large groups? So concert halls, sporting events, business to business conventions, and then ultimately in this environment where people are feeling stretched financially and really looking at every nickel and dime that we all spend, is that resetting our budgetary expectations for media? And that could be resetting them up or down. And I think companies right now are really trying to understand, at least based on these early signals, whether bigger changes are coming down the road more quickly than were previously happening. Right. And it's hard to plan for, you know, three or six months down the road. But when it comes to that, you know, mid to longer term strategic thinking, getting through to the other side of this, how is that uh, impacting plans now to make right. sure companies that are set up for the long term and the other side of this? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And so we, we at EY think about it in, in three different phases that, that somewhat overlap. So there's dealing with what's urgent right now. And again, it's the workforce, it's cash flow, it's liquidity, it's making sure you're serving your clients or customers uh, as they need to be served right now. Moving into the next phase is really understanding how do we create a more resilient enterprise? Um, what sort of changes do we need to make and how we conduct our business, how we run our operations um, that will allow us to respond to what could be a choppy and uneven recovery with openings and closings and the like and really fortifying our operations for any different scenario. And there's a lot of scenario planning and forecasting that's being done. And then for our most well-capitalized clients, the ones who are in a position to really think strategically for the longer term, there are teams stood up are standing up at, at companies right now saying, how do we strategically position our business in terms of our growth agenda? Do we need to accelerate projects, organic projects that we've been developing internally? Do we need to look more aggressively at a strategic agenda that includes some M&A and maybe even being opportunistic uh, with some targets that were on the radar screen previously that now might be much more attractively priced? So we think there's, a, there's a, an overlapping uh, set of agendas at play right now with different time horizons attached to them. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, for those companies that were really facing, I guess you could say, what is the harsh reality of the need to really reinvent themselves before this whole thing, realistically, how long do you think that they can hold on without long lasting permanent, permanent damage to their businesses? Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's almost you know, you have to look at it almost on a case by case basis. And you know, some companies, particularly companies that have a revenue model that's completely tied to the aggregation of physical audiences and admissions and ticket sales and the like, um, those companies are in a a rescue mode and really trying to just make it through to August, September, October, whenever we're all um, hopefully back um, or at least allowed back into the world. Uh, in a way that we used to uh, used to be. I think companies that are um, maybe not faced with that immediate urgency are taking a much more balanced look at what they can change operationally to create the most amount of flexibility to then go pursue growth with however the new normal shakes out.
Yeah, well, it's definitely going to take a lot of creativity and planning, and it's an interesting story to track, so we'll stay on it, and thank you so much for your insights today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. Thanks so much for watching. This is Alyssa Quorum, and we'll see you next time.